Hi, so welcome to the Business Spotlight uh, interview today. Uh, somebody who's on a mission to give one million children an awesome experience of science. So Rene Watson, founder of and head of Explosions, at the Curiosity Box. How are you today, Rene? Hi, David. Yeah, I'm doing really well, thanks. Fantastic. Well, firstly, thank you ever so much for taking the time, time to join us today and share your journey. Now, I, I love that job title, Head of Explosions. <laughs> So perhaps you could start off with sharing a little bit about what it is that you do and what that job role actually is. Well, it's I guess it's a bit of a play on words um, in that I do do literal explosions, okay. um, usually involving something that's fairly safe, but can be done to give kids a, an amazing kind of wow moment at school. Um, and also my like, I just I love explosive ideas. So thinking about creative ways that we can get all people, but particularly children, having a go at science. That's really, that's kind of my thing, really. That sounds cool. So what is it that Curiosity, Curiosity Box actually does? What, what are the services you provide? Yeah, so we started, um, we've been going about seven years, and I started really with the intention of getting more kids doing more hands-on practical science experiments and engineering activities, um, because it makes me really sad that they don't get to do so much of that in school. And we have a big issue in this country, as with many other countries, that we have a huge sh shortfall in the number of engineers, scientists in our workforce. Um, so there are a number of issues that need to be addressed. And actually primary school kids, particularly upper primary, is where children are really forming their opinions of themselves and what kinds of career they might they might have. So when I launched Curiosity Box, what I thought was, this is going to be so easy. I know how to do really fun hands-on experiments. I'm going to whack those in boxes and send them to families at home so that more kids can do that at home. Um, didn't really know very much about anything else. Didn't really know much about e-commerce business or digital marketing or anything like that. Producing a physical product was completely new. Uh, so that's all been a fairly steep learning curve. And the evolution of the business has brought us to where we are today um, through, as you can imagine, quite an interesting couple of years yeah. um, where we now actually work more with schools than we do with families at home. And we get, we work with all sorts of different organizations, big ones, uh, government organizations, uh, smaller SMEs, and we get them to fund boxes to go into schools. So we're sending physical resources of STEM activities into classrooms so that we're empowering teachers to be able to give kids more hands-on experiences of, of science, tech, engineering, and maths, which we call STEM, in the classroom. That sounds really cool. So the, the sort of ambition then is to educate children or give them an exposure through a sort of a, an engineering type of um, outcome future in life and things like that then, is it? Yeah, partly, though. I mean, that's kind of, for me, that's like the bonus side effect. Okay. But actually the thing that makes me, that really kind of fires me up is that when you've got what we call a greater level of science capital, so a a kind of scientific thinking mindset. So problem solving, being analytical, kind of thinking about how and having techniques for analyzing risk and balancing risk um, for some of the, the practical skills of doing science. All of those things help us to engage with the world in a more uh, productive and informed way. And so if we're giving kids greater levels of science capital, whatever it is they choose to do as a career, it's going to mean that they can um, they can operate in this world in in a more effective manner, and it's just super fun. So it's also about bringing some joy, thinking about how they are as a human in this world, and understanding it a little bit better, and having some tools to know how they can find out how to understand it better. That's that's really yeah, you're right. There's some life skills that are attributed to that lateral thinking, that problem yeah. solving, and yeah, really good. So you mentioned about um, obviously a passion that you went into to do, and it's very common for a lot of business owners to sort of follow their passion, whatever industry they're from, and start their own organization company in, in, in line with that passion. And then the business experience alongside that, because being in business is its own is its own entity. So if you had the opportunity to go back, if you could wind the clock back and start again, would you do anything differently? And if you if you would, what sort of things would you do differently? 
Oh, yeah, I do loads differently. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever have you ever interviewed someone who said, nah, I'd do it exactly the same? Uh, occasionally, not very often, to be so, fair. Occasionally. Um, <laughs> I think on those occasions, though, it is I've learned from those mistakes. So it's yeah, kind of fair enough. The necessary process to get to where they've got to. Yeah. So I, I think there are some key things that I would do differently. Uh, first of all, I would um, I would make sure that I stayed perhaps slightly more focused on the one thing that was going to get us to a point of financial uh, sustainability and stability. Yeah. Um, I, as I said earlier, love ideas and we develop all of the products that we also make here in Ensham. Um, and I absolutely love that bit. And so there is a real temptation, I think, to be a bit of a magpie and to be like, oh, look, let's do that. Oh, that sounds great. Let's do that. And I think it's a it is also quite a classic um symptom of being a, an entrepreneur is that you're fired up by ideas and actually staying focused on the one thing that's going to make you successful can be quite difficult. Um, so we we've got strategies now for managing that much better than we used to. Um and so so that would be one thing I'd do differently. I think the second thing I would do better, so not necessarily differently but certainly better would be valuing my time and expertise more. I think when you create a physical product, often the discussions you have become quite transactional around the product when actually I'm bringing 20 years of experience and expertise in science communication and engaging with schools and building networks, managing partnerships, all of those things, which at the beginning I didn't build into our costing yeah. um, or our charging at all. We do now. We know we will we know better. Um, but yeah, I would I would do that from the beginning. And then the third thing I would do differently is um around how we funded the business at the beginning. So I did a an investment round, a small investment round. And I I don't come from a very wealthy background. I come from a single parent family from rural Australia. Um and my, I think relatively my understanding of how businesses were valued was really very bad. So if I had my time again, I would raise a lot more money at the same valuation as we, as we did probably would be what I'd be aiming for or value the business okay. more at the beginning. So there was a degree of sort of undervaluing what the business yeah. was capable of, what the opportunity was. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a couple of really good points there. I love the I love the thing about sort of focusing on one thing that's going to make you financially stable because we live in a world of just constant overload of data, like you say, shiny new objects to chase and things. And yeah. as entrepreneurs, you're dead right. It's kind of, that's the exciting bit, isn't it? Um, one of the things of a lot of successful business owners and successful professionals is they're really clear on what it is they're trying to do long-term and stick to that and be disciplined around, around it. That's really good. In the valuing of your own time, have you heard of the story of Picasso with a napkin? No. Okay, so Picasso was, I can't remember if it was in Italy, in, in Italy sort of coffee shop or something. The story goes that he was sat in a coffee shop, a couple of um, tourists come along, oh, it's Picasso. Oh, I wonder if he'll do a picture for us. So they go and ask him to draw a picture. And on a napkin, he, he draws a very simple outline of a dove. Hands it over to them and says, that's two million francs or, or, or wherever he was sat <laughs> yeah. in time. Like, what, what do you mean that's crazy? It took you 30 seconds to write. I said, no, no. It took me 20 years to learn how to do that. That's what you're paying for. It's sort of don't over don't underestimate your your your, your, edu, you know, your ability, your skills, your knowledge, and things like that. Yeah. Really Be cool. more Picasso. That's a good takeaway from this. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Have the confidence. Have the confidence that you yeah. know what you're worth. So if and you I were... think women are also particularly um succumb to that undervaluing of ourselves. Yeah. Um so I I have since starting this business met a load of other female role models who have got me to the point of like a mindset of going, damn straight I'm worth that. And yeah. yes, I can be ambitious. And yes, I can, I can, you know, want the value that I deserve. So it's taken me a little while to get there, but. So that can sound a bit arrogant, but it's actually having confidence in yourself, isn't it? And confidence yeah. in the products and service that you offer. Mm -hmm. 
So if we just dig into the sort of financial side of it, and you mentioned around the valuation and getting funding and going for more funding and things like that, what sort of advice would you give? Because obviously financial um, information and management is really important to businesses, especially in startup. Mm. What advice would you give to new business owners that, you know, regarding their financial management? What, what, what tips would you give them? Or what learnings have you got from that? Yeah, I think the first thing that <clears throat> is relevant to me and I, I'm sure is relevant to some others, but though probably not all, is um, is to know your strengths and weaknesses. So I knew coming into this business, as, as you sort of mentioned earlier, this is a very purpose driven business. It's about getting kids doing science. It's not about building. I didn't start it for the purpose of making a business. The business just seemed like the most efficient way of getting progress against that purpose. Um, and so I know that financial management is absolutely not my strength. Like I'm a scientist by training. That's, that's kind of my thing. So I think my, my advice would be know your weaknesses and find people who are good at that stuff and get them involved as quickly as you can. Yeah. <clears throat> so outsource, outsource the stuff that you don't feel like, you know, motivates you or that you've got the energy or the expertise for and help and get that person to mentor you so that you get better at it yourself. So it's not just kind of handing it over and then not ever learning anything. Um, but, you know, you can take your time then to to get good at stuff. Uh, and then the second thing, which is not anything new, um, is that that whole cash is king um, philosophy, you know, managing your cash flow. We have had some incredibly difficult you know, very tight, squeezy moments because um, when you're making a physical physical product, there's a there's a lot of outlay, yeah, a lot of overhead, um, and that certainly the things that have caused me the most stress in the business have have all been around cash flow. Yeah, I think that's a very common common theme out there. Cash flow is certainly the oxygen of a business. Without it, it just mm -hmm. can't can't survive. It can't grow. Things like yeah. that. Um strengths and weaknesses getting the right people around you so have you, how, how big a team have you got at the moment what, what sort of size organization are you so we've got a team of six and then um depending on so because we make the product it sort of depends on the orders that we get in so we also have a sort of pool of they're all mums um who we can call on so if we get a big order and we need more hands on deck packing boxes then we can call on our team of mums to come in and help out with that yeah. Um, but yeah, a, t a core team of six who who work here, including two people who are sort of our our kind of lead box packers, okay. um, and then sort of ops, marketing, and production um, alongside that. So, what sort of qualities do you look for in 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 the people in your team, and you know, how do you then create a high performing culture within within that environment? Um, so, in terms of the qualities that I look for, I think. It's really important to me that the people who come to work here really want to work here. Uh, so having some level of alignment with our vision is actually is is really important. Um, we are actually an entire team of women, and I think there is something that I recognize when I've taken women into the business, particularly those who have perhaps been out of work or taken a career change to accommodate growing a family um they might not necessarily recognize their value and their worth at that time and so what i look for is a willingness to grow and an, a kind of indication that that confidence can be rebuilt because then i think you're working with somebody who is a, a kind of an exciting person who can in a way shape their own role in the business as much as you shape them into the role. Um, and that very much stays with the way that we um, we help people to continue to be part of this business. So I don't really do performance management. I don't like the idea of human resources. I think I like the idea of humans. Okay. Um, I think when you add words like resource and performance, it sort of, dehumanizes the way that we connect with people um, and it changes the dynamic of the relationship and what is possible to 
to kind of get out of those people. So I try and build relationships based on trust. Um, we have a process for doing that. So it's not completely process free, yeah. um, which I call the value equation, where uh, once a year we go through and look at um, all of the things that is going to make that person feel successful. So it might be the money they earn, how they're spending their time, the things that are important to them, not just in work, but outside of work as well. And we have a conversation around that and we map out some of the things that they want to be working on in the next 12 months. And then we do regular reviews um, and, and kind of check-ins on, on where people are at with that. And that is the, the kind of framework for how we grow people through and into the business. Sounds like you've got a really clear idea of what the vision is and where you're heading. And then you created a really empowering and collaborative culture for people to work in the environment to work within yeah i hope so um i i mean i think the the people who work here do really like working here yeah um i'd have to say that partly because of that and because so the the biggest issue that i tend to face with my team is people working too much that's that tends to be the biggest problem so um and particularly through COVID, uh, when we were really busy, because you know families at home were all like desperate to get their hands on whatever they could to help support their their kids working and doing education at home. Yeah. Um, we actually quite a few of the processes that we had put in place just fell by the wayside, and but because we'd had that in place, actually the team was able to um, carry on working and really were working an awful lot at that point. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, they're just amazing. Great, great bunch of people. So, sounds it. Sounds like a nice organization to be part of. And in terms of balancing that personal time, you say one of the biggest challenges is your team working too much and, and you know, you included in this, how, how do you make sure that there's that balance between personal time and the, the demands of being in a business? Yeah, I uh, I have traditionally been extremely bad at that. Most entrepreneurs are, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, however, in 2019, I sort of, I burnt out and I really wasn't doing that great. And I, at that point, recognized that I had to make a decision to either continue feeling awful yeah. or put in place a strategy to help me to support me to be able to do the work I want to do but also kind of exist in this world in the way I wanted to be as a mother and as a friend and as an individual and all of those things um and so since then I've gotten quite good at protecting time okay. for the various things that I want to be spending my time on um including things that like I do regular walks in the woods where I I know this is going to make me sound like a complete geek and a bit of a weirdo, but I love, like I'm obsessed with mushrooms. Okay. Um, and the reason fungi and the reason that I love fungi is because they're small. And so when you go into the woods, you don't just go for a walk. You have to go like I really have to slow down. You don't see them if you don't go slow. And so for someone who lives at a hundred miles an hour, that's a really good balancing um, technique or thing I do to, slow me down and that has helped massively to be able to keep going through times when actually it's only my resilience that's kept us going that's a really nice share because you're right sometimes burnout is is really challenging and sometimes it's really hard to stop and sometimes yeah. sometimes ironically the best way to move forward faster is to stop and take time to stop yeah I really like that that sort of habit if you like or thought process of identifying something small that you have to slow down whilst you're in that environment to notice it yeah tricking yourself to take that time really clever what sort of things did you did, did you what sort of process did you go through to i not not so much identify the the, the, the burnout but actually to identify what things were going to help what you know what um i did a range of things i've got i've got some really good friends who i was able to kind of they were happy to share some of what I was kind of carrying so that I could offload some of it. And that helps because I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, it can feel very lonely and quite isolated and you feel like you're carrying a huge burden that you can't share. And people out there are really willing to help if you ask, aren't they? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And def- I mean, I've been very, very lucky. I think partly because of the business that I run is something that generally people think is pretty cool. So they're very willing to help. Um, so yeah, I, I think sharing some of the load with people who are willing to take some of it. Um, I saw a therapist for quite a long time where I just created an hour of space where I could have somebody who it was like facilitated listening rather than just a friend or a mentor who would listen. And, you know, it's a slightly different role that they played. And through that, I was able to identify the things that recharge me and then really protecting and carving out time for those things. So there's a kind of whole web of support. You know, it really is a support net that I, um, that I now protect quite fiercely. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. And where do you see yourself in the next five years? What does the next five years look like for um, Curiosity Box and for yourself? Yeah, so it's a it's a int- very interesting question at this point in time because it is a time when we're embarking on quite a big change okay. um, personally and with the business. So it has come to a point, Curiosity Box, where it's not a startup anymore and we're kind of, we're in that transition into a kind of more scaled sort of sustained business. And I've recognized and worked with the team to recognize that actually what the business needs is something a bit different to A, my skill set and B, what I'm willing to give or have the kind of motivation to give. Um, And the kind of partnerships that we're negotiating and the kind of financial management that the business needs is a bit different to where my skill set is. So we have been um, growing some of the people, existing people in the team into more leadership roles over the last 12 months. And we are in the final stages of recruiting an MD, which is very exciting. And we've had some, like, I've been blown away by the candidates we've had come forward. It's, It's really super exciting. So we will have someone in post by probably May, I would say. We'll probably finish interviews sort of April and maybe May, maybe June. Um, and a part of that picture is that in uh, later this year, I'm going to be moving back to Australia. Okay. Um, so I'll still stay involved with the business. I'll still be CEO and I'll still, you know, uh, play quite a clear role in terms of promoting the vision and, um and helping to and supporting all the people in the team and holding the culture, that sort of thing. Um, but on a day to day basis, there will be somebody else running it. And it depends a little bit on who that person is as to what the next three to five years holds for the business. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I think that so it also as a part of that, there will be some equity as a part of that appointment. And we will be putting in place an EMI share scheme for the rest of the team. Yeah. And I think that sets us on a trajectory to be looking potentially to sell the business within three to five years. Okay. Um, We have had conversations. We've been approached before on that, but we weren't really in a position where I felt we could leverage maximum value. Um, But I think in three to five years with someone who has a very specific remit for looking at how we improve the financial success of the business, uh, build our partnership network, uh, then we're on track to having a business that will be a really lovely one to to sell in a few years' time. Super exciting. Yeah, it is. Very good. Yeah. Well, listen, look, that's been really, really informative. It's been great having you on. Thank you ever so much for your openness and sharing sharing your your highs and your lows as well. Yeah. Now, where would our listeners go to find out a little bit more about Curiosity Box and and how do they get in touch with you guys? Uh, So the easiest thing is our website, um, which is curiosity-box.com. And on the homepage there, you can see if you're you're a corporate or an organization that wants to support more kids doing STEM, then there's a partnerships link. If you're a mum or a dad or a groovy grandma or an awesome auntie, then you want to buy some kits for, for the children in your world, then there's a link there for families. So, and schools can find loads of information for schools on there as well perfect that's been awesome thank you ever so much thank you david take care